Hello there. Thanks for joining me this Wednesday. I'm Otto Othman, and these are tonight's headlines. Zahid grilled for over eight hours by the MACC. 42 new food poisoning cases reported due to contaminated laksa. And dozens killed in catastrophic Kenya bus crash. In Kedah, following two deaths reported from food poisoning after consuming laksa in Kupang Baling yesterday, the health ministry said it detected 42 new cases believed to be from the same source of food. 14 of the cases were reported in Kedah, 7 in Pera and 21 in Selangor. This brings the total number of such cases reported to 61. According to the ministry's director general, Dato Dr. Nur Hisham Abdullah, the victims had apparently bought laksa at the laksa outlet in Kupang Baling Kedah, which is the same references reported by the earlier victims. 21 victims were warded, while the rest were given outpatient treatment. The Kedah Health Department has conducted checks at the outlet, and it was discovered that the laksa ingredients did not contain the iceberg lettuce, as went viral in the social media. So far, the health ministry is awaiting the lab results of the tests conducted on the food samples, while the stool samples of two victims in Baling tested positive for Salam Salmonella SPP. AMNO President Dato Sri Ahmad Zain Hamidi has finally wrapped up his third round of questioning with the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC, today after over eight grueling hours in the building. The Bagan Dato MP was summoned today to give a statement over an alleged misappropriation of funds from his family-owned welfare foundation. The former Deputy Prime Minister arrived at about 9.20 this morning and left around 5.40 p.m. Dato Sri Zahid's daughter, Dato Nurul Hidayah Ahmad Zahid, and his stepbrother, Dato Sri Muhammad Nase Ahmad Tarmizi, also had their statements recorded. This is the third visit to the MACC headquarters since July, and he has been asked to return for another round of questioning tomorrow morning. He was previously summoned by the Commission over allegations relating to the Yayasan Akal Budi funds and one Malaysia development Perhad. The AMNO president is believed to have abused over 800,000 ringgit from the foundation to settle his and his wife's credit card bills between 2014 and 2015. Meanwhile, MACC Chief Commissioner Dato Sri Muhammad Shukri Abdul said there is no need to investigate who among its officers leaked information on Dato Sri Zahid being called for questioning. Thus, he spoke to the media after attending the Gearing Up for Corporate Liability Seminar in Putrajaya today after calls were made for a probe to be carried out. Bila kita surf notice pada Datuk Seri Zahir, bukan benda tu bukan satu rahsia. Kita surf notice, Datuk Seri Zahir mungkin dia beritahu pada lawyer dia, dia beritahu pada isteri dia, pada anak-anak, ada keluarga, sahabat dia. Sam bukan satu sekresi, bukan satu confidential. So, kita nak kata likir pada orang dalam atau likir pada dolar, bukan sekresi lagi. Sebab notice tu dah jadi public documents. This followed Amno Supreme Council member Datuk Lokman Nur Adams claim that he had friends in the MECC who had informed him on the matter. He was also among those who called for a probe urged the MECC to investigate if there was a mole in the agency. A former Selangor Community Development Department Kamas director was today acquitted and discharged by the Alostar Sessions Court of Corruption and Money Laundering Charges. Judge Azman Abu Hassan ordered Muhammad Adnan Muhammad Daud, age 55, to be freed after finding that the defense had succeeded in raising reasonable doubts in the case. The decision covered charges brought against him in the Alostar and Shalam courts. On June 16th last year, Muhammad Adnan was charged in the Sessions Court with two counts of receiving bribes involving almost 160,000 ringgit.
Part of the money was used as an inducement to appoint Alpha Elite Resource to supply chocolate milk powder to Paramata Child Care Centers and as an inducement for him to appoint five companies to supply various goods to the child care centers. He was alleged to have used the check to pay the deposit for a double-story semi-detached house in Setia Alam Silango on January 8, 2015. The MACC in Johor have remanded a managing director with a Dato title and six other company executives to assist in investigations related to fraudulent claims. The investigation stemmed from false claims made regarding the maintenance of village roads throughout Johor from 2014, with no work having been carried out to this day. The total maintenance cost amounting to between 50 million and 70 million ringgit per year. Three suspects aged between 30 and 60, including the Dato, were produced at the Johor Baru Sessions Court today to be remanded for three days until October 14th, while three others, including a woman, were remanded until October 15th. Another woman could not be produced in court today as she was pregnant. The case is being investigated under the MECC Act, which provides a fine five times the value of the bribe or 10,000 ringgit, whichever is higher an imprisonment not exceeding 20 years to those found guilty. A man who is believed to have dismembered his own father at Kampong Kantan Baru Ipo yesterday has been remanded for seven days from today. The remand was issued to facilitate a probe into the murder case following the discovery of Yu Su Kim's body parts in a septic tank yesterday. The gruesome scene was discovered by the 74-year-old victim's daughter at about 9 a.m. after noticing blood on a mattress, pillow, and a wall of the house. The victim's limbs were found buried at an open space behind the house with the head found on top of the buried parts, while the torso was found dumped inside a disused septic tank. Police found the son at the house when they arrived at the scene and arrested him at about 1.30 p.m. A 60-centimeter machete believed to have been used to cut up the victim's body was also recovered yesterday. According to authorities, the suspect was believed to be high on drugs when he allegedly murdered his father after being scolded for taking shabu in the house. The suspect, a divorcee and father of two, was reportedly a contractor but had been jobless for three months and had been living with his paralyzed father for seven, several years. The case is being investigated under Section 302 of the Penal Code for murder. In Turangano, the Kuala Turangano Sharia High Court sentenced a woman to four strokes of the cane and to undergo rehabilitation after she pleaded guilty to a prostitution charge. Judge Kamaru Zazmi Ismail meted out the penalties after considering several facts including that it was the woman's first offense and that the severity of the crime under Islam. He also granted the 45-year-old a 14-day period to appeal her caning sentence. The woman, who was represented by her lawyer, Fazru Anwa Yusuf, has been ordered to spend the next six months in rehabilitation at the Baitul Ehsan Women's Shelter in Sabah, Barnam. She was caught in a room with a man believed to be her client during a raid at the hotel in Pulau Duyong on September 19th. Enforcers from the Trigano Religious Affairs Department also seized eight items from the room, including unused condoms, bottles of oil, and lubricant gel. A rapid KL bus believed to be having technical problems skidded and rammed into three vehicles on Jalan Rajachulan this morning. Two drivers in the other vehicles were reportedly injured, while six passengers in the bus escaped unhurt. According to police, the bus was on its way from Bukit Bintang to the city centre when the accident occurred. Upon reaching a bend, the bus experienced technical problems, causing the driver to lose control of the vehicle. The bus then skidded and ran over a divider before entering the opposite side of the road and rabbing into three vehicles. The bus then rammed into the three vehicles. Rapid KL has said that it will give full cooperation to police regarding the incident. The case is being investigated under the Road Transport Act.
The Prime Minister today reminded that no reminded that no man is above the law. He further stressed that without this foundational and stabilizing principle of the country's constitution hang intact, Malaysia would never stand a chance at recovering as it hopes for. At the Prime Minister's Department's monthly assembly in Dataran Perdana this morning, he said that although there are ways to improve law and order in society, the notion of might makes right approach to governing and exercising force against the people can no longer prevail. Walaupun kuasa diberi kepada pemerintah, ini tidak bermakna pemerintah boleh buat apa saja. Jika ada sesuatu yang bertentangan dengan undang-undang ataupun sesuatu yang tidak adil, maka rakyat berhak bertindak ke atas kerajaan juga. Demikian juga dengan rakyat. Rakyat tujuan undang-undang ialah untuk melindungi hak rakyat. Hak rakyat ditentukan supaya tidak ada penindasan walau oleh raja ataupun kerajaan kerana dengan adanya undang-undang ini barulah kita akan lihat keadilan berlaku dalam masyarakat kita. Mentioning law as equal to all, Tun Dr. Mahathir also posed this reminder to everyone who holds a certain degree of power, including the prime minister, rulers, ministers or administrative officers, the police and the military, adding that the ramifications of non-compliance to the rule of law would only lead to chaos and make the country's recovery process difficult. Mahkamah-mahkamah yang sedia ada dalam negara kita. Bagi pihak hakim juga. Meanwhile, Tun Dr. Mahathir also reminded the judiciary to commit to discharging their duties impartially according to the rule of law without fear of anyone, including the previous government. Now, he further stressed that the judiciary system is a legislative body that should be free from political influence or intervention. Bagi pihak hakim juga, mereka tidak perlu takut apabila menjalankan Tugas mereka secara adil yang diutamakan ialah keadilan bukan kerana takut kerana tidak akan dipilih tidak dinaikkan pangkat oleh pihak tertentu. Sebab itulah sekarang ini pemilihan hakim juga akan diberi kepada parlimen wakil rakyat yang dipilih oleh rakyat semua. Mereka lah yang akan menentukan baik atau tidaknya calon yang dikemukakan kalau dahulu to Dr Mahathir cited the three separation of powers in the country the legislative executive and judiciary all pertinent components that enhance democracy together they enhance a mutually respectful and independent partnership on behalf of the public's right to the maintenance of justice More after the break, Saudis terrified over discovery of dead body on highway. The details up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now let's take a look at our daily segment clickbait for what's trending and making rounds in the cyber world today. Now, what was the most disturbing video you have seen recently? Well, this might just be it, as a video of a dead body tied to a bed that was spotted on a Saudi Arabia highway went viral on, so on social media. Now, it was believed that the body belongs to an illegal immigrant who had rifle caliber gunshot wounds on his body. The bizarre discovery came from the drivers who were passing the road 11 kilometers away from the southern Saudi city of Abha. As shown in the video, the dead body was wrapped in a blanket, laying on an iron bed without mattress, right in the middle of the road. Authorities, however, said that it was unclear whether the man was shot dead on the bed or if he was tied to it post-mortem while the incident remains under investigation. Over in China, three boys turned a 20-meter-long escalator at a shopping mall into their playground when they repeatedly slid down their handrails. A video of the scene was posted on Chinese social media platforms and has drawn the ire of netizens. In the 46-second video, instead of 
chiding the boys for their mischievous yet dangerous acts, two women were filmed cheering them on at the bottom of the escalator. As the video went viral, many netizens pointed out that the boys had blatantly ignored a sign on the escalator saying it was under repair and entry is prohibited. While several of them also slammed the adults for supporting such dangerous behavior. Hopefully, our parents could take this as a gentle reminder as such act is not funny at all. And kids, do not try to copy this. Now, updated as of 7 p.m., here are the top trending topics and searches on the internet today. What could have been a local governance issue on road closures has now become the talk of the nation. DAP's Pangkalan Batu Assemblyman Norhizam Hassan Bakti got into a heated argument with residents of Kampong Pulau Nibong in Malacca on Tuesday over two controversial shortcuts. The dialogue was arranged after some 600 residents of Taman Akasia demanded that the link be closed following a spate of accidents and motorcycle thefts in the residential area. What was supposed to be a planned dialogue between 600 residents of Taman Akasia and Norhizam to discuss the closure of the two shortcuts became heated when 58-year-old Muhammad Derus Tompang, along with several other villagers, started hounding the assemblymen on the closures. The two shortcuts connecting Jalan Akasia 4 and Jalan Akasia 7 to Jalan Pulau Nibong were opened in 2005 and 2007, respectively, by Muhammad Derus. Apart from the spate of accidents and thefts, Taman Akasia Residents Association Chairman also claims that the shortcuts were opened without counselling the residents. The villagers, on the other hand, had wanted the shortcuts to remain open as they serve as the main route. Saya turun padang buat kerja. Saya berdepan dengan 20 orang yang buat provokasi, yang mentang saya. Jadi saya, saya adab lah, kan? Suara mereka tinggi. Saya kena tinggi kan suara. Itu saja. Saya tak cakap benda-benda yang kurang ajar. According to media reports, the villagers did not expect Norhizam, who is also state exco for agriculture, entrepreneur development and agro-based industry, to get riled up and react the way he did. Norhizam has also threatened to sue those that have shared and viraled the video depicting his confrontation with the villagers. Meanwhile, Malacca Chief Minister Adli Zahari today apologized to the villagers of Kampong Pulau Nibong on behalf of the state government over the incident which he said shouldn't have happened and that the matter should have been handled by the local council instead of Norhizam. World Mental Health Day 2018 is observed on October 10th across the world with this year's theme, Young People and Mental Health in a Changing World. Now, according to World Health Organization, half of all mental illness begins by the age of 14, but most cases go undetected and untreated. Now, in terms of burden of the disease among adolescents, depression is the third leading cause. Now, to give us more insights on how the situation is in Malaysia, we have with us Dr. Nur Faiza Ali, a psychiatrist and lecturer from the medical faculty in UITM. Hi, Dr. Faiza. Thanks for joining us. Now, let's get straight to the point. What are the statistics of mental health problems in our country? And at the moment, does it seem worrying? 
statistic in of mental health issues in Malaysia is actually very worrying because um, generally, uh, the, uh, according to the National Health and Morbidity Service in 2015, um, you know, adult above 16 years old in Malaysia, at least one in three of us suffers from some mental health issues. And looking uh, specific, specifically at our uh, young people, the adolescents, um, the most recent report uh, of the National Health and Morbidity Survey in uh, year 2017, it shows uh, out of the 5.5 million um, adolescents that we have, one in five actually suffers from depression. And uh, more worrying, two out of five are very anxious and about 10% of our adolescents are very stressed. Now, what are some suggestions for the government and the public to take up to help the society in uh, combating mental health problems? As a society and also together with the government, um, should really work together hand in hand um, uh, uh, to actually come out with ways of, uh, of increasing the awareness of, um, you know, good um, mental and also physical well-being. One of the um, one of the ways that we can actually promote good mental health uh, awareness is that to have more, um, uh, you know, so, uh, service um, more um, programs. Uh, to actually get, uh, give information and uh, to actually provide um, uh, give information about the illness um, and the symptoms of uh, mental health issues and at the same time as well uh, to actually provide the information of how to get help if uh, we see ourselves or the people around us are struggling with mental health issues. Um, therefore, uh, when, once we actually normalize the symptoms and also we can talk freely about it, then uh, maybe we can uh, see, we can get um, you know, early treatment for those who are suffering from the mental illness. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Faiza, for those insights.